Okay, so this upcoming talk now, Proactive Password Leak Processing with Bruce Marshall. Uh, I know the schedule says uh, 25 minutes. It's going to be uh, a bit more than that, up to maybe 50 minutes. I don't know, we'll see. Uh, and as I said before, you can very easily go without food for several days. So even though there's lunch afterwards, I will highly recommend you to stay here and listen to the entire talk. Uh, because this is gonna be a good one as well. Uh, Bruce is one of those that have been with us ever since we started doing a password scan in Las Vegas four years ago. So I will just uh, leave the stage for him. Go ahead, Bruce. All right, thanks, Per. So he yeah, has the, uh, I run the passwordresearch.com website, which I started 10, 15 years ago, and not, not quite 15 years ago. Uh, to try to gather some of the research, uh, specifically starting with the academic community, um, but then I've since added more from events like this, which I would consider non-academic for the most part, and trying to share that information, make it more accessible, and essentially provide an index to people like us who work in the private, you know, industrial, government type fields, so we can benefit from some of that knowledge. And my last couple of presentations, as Perez mentioned, I've, I've presented several different times on security questions, on uh, passphrases like Dicewarex, KCD, pass style passphrases, um, and password expiration. And some of those have been driven by data that I've found, like the security questions and password expiration was based on password data that I had and some, some uh, internet dumps that had security questions and answers. Um, and this is one that's been a little bit different because I, I started out just hearing about these companies looking at leaks, like Microsoft going out, they announced here a couple months ago they were gonna start, you know, or and maybe they've already been doing it for a while, but they, they announced at least that they were gonna be looking at password leaks and looking at things like that to try to protect their accounts um, of, their, of their users, their customers. And so as I was collecting this information, I started hearing more and more about it, and I decided that I wanted to kind of try to gather what we know right now that companies are doing and talk about the techniques that they're using and talk about the different alternatives you have if you're considering this or um, if you're debating whether it's even worth your time. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to do that now is because uh, in some ways, in, in some things in the industry, we kind of get broadsided by stuff by either auditors or standards, you know, OWASP or SANS or somebody comes out with a new guideline on something and then we have to figure out how to do it. Um, so this is kind of my way of helping start that conversation along before we're too far in where, you know, 99% of the industry isn't doing anything related to this. Um, so let's get right into it. Uh, and like Per said, I'm, there was some confusion. I, I had thought that I had a 55-minute slot, so I have about that much material prepared, but I'm going to try to pare it down to uh, probably closer to 30, 35 minutes. Try to be respectful, but we'll see. I, I, I have no guarantees. Yeah. <laughs> you just, just raise your hand and Per will bring you a little cup of I'll, juice. And... I'll be locking up the doors. There's no way of getting out that way. <laughs> right. So password reuse, if you're not sure what that term means, basically is a person using a password on multiple sites or multiple applications. Typically, in this case, we're primarily interested in the Internet, but you could say it in a corporate environment or something like that. Um, and so to try to measure the extent of it, I'm going to give you some, some stats, and this is where I'll kind of not spend a lot of time. But there's several different ways we can kind of measure that, and, and there's additional stats that I don't have just because there's more than we really need. But just to give you a rough sense of it, when, when actually asked what they do, um, which can be somewhat problematic because people either idealize what they do or they underestimate what they do, um, roughly you know, anywhere from 46 to 60% of people say that they at least use passwords on several sites or they reuse passwords um, um, for different places they go on the internet. We can actually see that too um, in some research that's looked specifically at password leaks, which password leaks are essentially if a company gets hacked, like if you were in for Michael's last presentation talking about some of the data that gets dumped out. Um, they can compare passwords between the different users that are in both of those dumps, both of those uh, that were hacked from both of those organizations and see if they matched and, and kind of get a better feel for that. And so one of the research papers, um, academic research papers, was looking at how many had exact matches versus slight modifications. You know, maybe the password policy is different on one site than the other, so they had to add a capital letter where normally they wouldn't have one or they add a number. 
or the, maybe they, some people like to do little prefixes, like for Facebook, the first three letters are FAC, things like that, where they felt like they were reasonably predictive. Um, and I guess I skipped it on the first slide, but these numbers and brackets here, I'm big on uh, references, since that was the point of me starting my website, was to point people back to the original sources of data. Um, and I'll have the references section at the end. So if you see something you want to dig in further, just write down the number and um, you can see actually where it comes from and do some reading yourself. Um, Troy Hunt also did some comparison between Yahoo Voices, Sony Pictures, and similar type of thing. He saw that around a little bit under 60% use the exact same password within that sample, and 2% has slight capitalization differences between those passwords. And finally, probably even the most accurate or at least more insightful is monitoring what people do uh, within their web browsers. Um, and two different, one study and one kind of industry type study have looked at that. Trustier, it's a little, they is getting a little bit old now, but I don't imagine things have changed too terribly much. Uh, had a, basically had a browser extension that would monitor where people were using their passwords for those, those, those customers. And I want to say that they had like four million different people that had that, that extension installed. And they were able to see that just specifically focusing on financial sites, that 73% of the people used their bank password or, or you know, their credit union, whatever, to log into at least one other site, which you would think that's very bad, and you would be right. <laughs> um, and then also the fact that they may have a different ID but they, but they, um, on other sites too, but they use the same password. And then um, in a smaller review of just more, more recent but smaller review of university students, they did a similar thing, installed a browser extension, looked at how many different sites they had versus how many passwords. And, and there's a lot more details in the studies that like, I'd encourage you to dig into if you're really interested. But 85% had fewer passwords than websites, than websites that they went to. So why is this a problem? Um, because of the ATO or account takeover threats, kind of what that, that type of uh, attack has been labeled where we as site owners start getting attacked because our users have made choices to reuse their passwords. Now, account takeover is not just a result of password reuse. It could be, re it could be a result of poor password choice. It could be a re um, someone's computer having a Trojan installed in it. You know, there's, there's different reasons for it, but password reuse is one of the threats, uh, is one of the, the causes of, of account takeover. And credential stuffing has kind of been the name that I think Shape Security kind of introduced that, and then OWASP, it's now on an OWASP wiki page, so it, it must be our standard, um, for using different credentials across multiple sites. So if you hear people say credential stuffing, that's what they're talking about. Account checkers then are the actual tools. I mean, anybody can write scripts to do um, password guessing against websites. I mean, we had a talk yesterday about my, brute, my BFF, my brute force framework, that. Uh, was talking about doing that against specific login systems. Um, and there's lots of custom, like if you go out and Google Facebook account checker or Instagram account checker, you'll see different standalone programs. But there are some that are more versatile. Um, Century MBA seems to be one of the like most professional grade uh, tools that can you essentially set up, you know, you can go run it through, automatically run it through proxies, you can have it, um, it can even interpret some OCR. So if you start getting an account lockout threshold where OCR prompts are being, or OCR, um, catch put prompts are being provided. It can OCR those and try to, you know, essentially bypass the are you a human check. Um, but Shard and CredMap, and I think Shard came out this year, those are specifically designed to try credentials across multiple websites. So you provide it with a credential list and it tries Facebook, Twitter, you know, MySpace, whatever else are programmed in there. So these tools are out there, they're available. In fact, they can be customized, I think, there's essentially a, you know, a template you can create to have it go try. Like if you want to add a site that's not in one of these existing tools, you can go out and create that, you know, get the parameters for the username, password, and maybe the failure success messages and, and go out there and do this. So the tools are there. This is, you know, in part what people are using in these account takeover attacks when people are sharing passwords. So how is, you know, is this real, how often is this happening? Um, all the way back in 2003, Google talked about seeing types of attacks against their sites. Um, you know, a million different Google accounts every day for weeks at a time that they were trying to combat. Um, and, you know, we kind of talk about the online, online guessing um, 
limitations where it's not nice, you know, not nice like offline password guessing where you can do billions of attempts a second depending on what password hash. Online, you're typically thinking, well, they're going to have account lockout or they're going to have IP blocking or they're going to have something like that. And as we'll talk about in a minute, there's ways of getting around IP blocking, but they even back then saw like 100 accounts per second, which is 6,000 you know, account tries per minute, which is a, a pretty substantial rate if they're having success. Um, today, most, most recently, Microsoft said um, every day they see 10 million, and they've, they've since updated it to like 12, billion or 12, 12 million or more um, credential attacks every day for the systems that they manage, their Microsoft account systems. So it's definitely a growing problem. Um, yes? Can I? Can you make did one? You? No, did you make an outrageous speaker I request? hope I didn't. For no brown M&Ms? Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. I appreciate it. That was part of my rider. <laughs> Thank you. You know, you never know if people are going to read those, so apparently they do. <laughs> oh, we do. We read everything. All right. So those private comments to you went to everybody. All right, all right. Um, Akamai is. Uh, you didn't tell anyone what, what, what you were actually going to do with those. Oh, okay, right. That's I appreciate you keeping that personal. Um, Akamai monitors a lot of the sites out on the internet, and they're able to see some more insights on their customers beyond just a single customer type of a situation. And they released this year in one of their reports, um, like nearly a, a you know a, a million IPs being used in, in one single attack against a financial customer. Um, throughout that period, 427 million accounts checked. And a s different customer, which I think they said was in the entertainment industry, was the, the second one here, you know, 817,000 different IPs. And looking at those IPs, of course, because they've got insight into both of those, they're able to see that there's about 70% 70, 70 overlap between them. So they, either they're using the same botnets or it's the same gang of people running these different types of attacks, or there's, you know, there, there's definitely, um, some correlation between those different attacks. So they're out there, they're trying, whether it's your site yet or not. I mean, only you, probably you know, or hopefully your logs will tell you. Uh, one of the interesting things that also Akamai said in that same report was that when new password leaks come out, like LinkedIn and MySpace and some of the others we've seen this year, they see spikes in account takeover, credential reuse type activity. They're specifically monitoring that types of stuff. Um, and one of the biggest examples of that happened last year was Taobao, the Chinese, kind of like an eBay reseller type site. Um, they were hit in the middle of October with uh, what authorities later said was a collection of 99 million credentials that successfully got them into about 20, 20 that matched at least 20.5 million active users on the Taobao site. Now, Taobao said that they didn't actually get in, they got blocked by maybe, you know, some. Um, contextual authentication type stuff, you know, they came from the wrong IPs or they had suspicious browser strings or something like that. But um, regardless of how many they actually blocked, um, the resulting cr crime resulting from getting into those accounts was around $1 million worth of fraud uh, that they detected and then had to deal with on their site. Uh, in less widespread nature, there's been a lot tech crunch here just in the last couple of weeks. Um, got hacked into due to a shared password in their content management system, and briefly someone pa pa posted a fake article. Uh, GitHub had problems, the same type of thing after LinkedIn came out, uh, the most recent LinkedIn uh, leak that uh, their users were being attacked with reused credentials, and they had to respond to that, and Shatbao um, was another one that said that someone got in because of a third-party breach and the credentials being the same as on their one of their administrators. So it's hard to quantify how many people have suffered account takeover due to password reuse because we often don't know why their account was taken over unless they say specifically, oh, I had the same password between eBay and my Facebook account. But we know as far as just account compromises in general, um, roughly 25% you know, of the population has experienced that in, in the past year and had to deal with the, the outcomes of that um, based on this survey. So why does that happen? I don't really want to spend too much time on this. There's lots of different reasons for people to want to get into accounts. Often you think like, why does someone get in, want to get into my Starbucks account? I can understand eBay or my bank, but why my Starbucks account? Typically there's some way they can either get money out of it, they can get you know, social proofing, they can do different things that are going to add value to them, 
or that they can sell to someone else that is interested in doing those things. So I guess one of the questions that we kind of have to answer is, is it our responsibility to care? Someone's chosen to reuse a password, and there's been research that says that people reuse passwords in, in part to deal as a coping mechanism to deal with the overload of passwords that they have. Um, you know, they don't try to choose something super complex so they can remember it. They try to reuse it in certain situations because they want to relieve that memory burden that they have of having, you know, if you had to memorize a password for every single service uh, or account that you have, um, that could be overwhelming. So they made the decision to reuse that password. Maybe they weren't as informed as they, should, they could have been, but they did make a decision about that. Um, so we do have the option, and, and most of us are in that default option right now, which is we're not doing anything. We wait until a, an account gets hacked and we respond to it, and you know, we can continue to do that if we want to. So from a perspective of back to what do users know, there's an excellent paper. Um, I don't think Dr. Craner is in here. Her team at Carnegie Mellon has done great research over the last few years, but one of the papers that I recommend to pretty much anybody dealing with password policy or authentication decisions is this one called, I added an exclamation mark at the end to make it secure, which is where they sat down in a lab and they asked people to create passwords for like a newspaper site, a bank site, and an email account, and they looked at what they did and kind of had them talk through the process, okay, I'm, this is my bank account, so I want a stronger password, or this is my email, so I want it to be something I can type in quickly. They, they, they got that feedback from the people that they talked to, and then they also talked to them after the fact, um, you know, why did you choose to make your bank password the same as your email password? Um, and so they specifically got feedback on password reuse, and a lot of people say, you know, kind of like, well, we know it's a bad thing to do, and um, I probably shouldn't be doing it, I'm not as concerned because it seems to not have any consequences for me. They're part of that, you know, maybe 75% of the people that haven't had their account taken over or that they can't trace back to um, password reuse being a problem, which, you know, that's, I, you can't argue with experience. In some cases, they, somebody can reuse a password and never have problems with it. It depends on some of the other factors of if that password is going to get disclosed um, through an attack or a breach somewhere. So, but part of the problem is that they don't have the same education that some of us have as to what constitutes good and bad password decisions, what constitutes um, risky situations that may expose their password to compromise. Um, three of the different people that they talk to, you know, say, hey, if, it's, if I've got a good password, I reuse it. I don't see a problem with that. Um, my reused password is not easily guessed. No one can guess my reused password. Well, so the researchers then took the passwords that were generated as part of this lab experiment used Hashcat blindly without, you know, with someone that didn't know what the values were to crack those resulting passwords or attempt to crack the passwords. And two of these three people had their passwords cracked. So maybe not the best, you know, judges of, of someone being able to guess their password. So that's my perspective. Um, I guess one more here. This was a guy that uh, recently just came out here. Uh, he was contacted by a news agency because his password had been breached as part of a O2 compromise over in, in, I guess, England. He talked about, well, you know, I reused that for O2 and eBay and Gumtree, and up to that point, he'd considered himself secure, on, secure online and internet savvy. So, um, you know, from his perspective, maybe he had thought his password was good enough. But the point being, um, sometimes we have to provide that guidance back to users. Um, you know, we establish minimums or we establish standards, and the users say, well, if you're saying I only have to, you know, do six character passwords, and that must be sufficient. Um, so, you know, the office, office space uh, flare scene here came to mind as far as that argument of, you know, well, you, why did you set the standard to this if this wasn't sufficient? And password reuse, it's a little bit harder for us to set standards, but um, our actions do kind of speak to that same question of, is this acceptable behavior or is it not acceptable behavior? I mean, users do also kind of have mixed feelings about who's responsible for that. Um, in one survey, 56% said the sites that they visit had ultimate responsibility for their, for their account protection. Uh, and another 39% said that websites are to blame if they have account compromises because they didn't offer the right security features. Whether it's multi-factor or stronger passwords or whatever it may be, um, they're placing some of that blame on it. So I would say, you know, given this, we kind of have a shared responsibility. Um, Alex Stamos, who was who's now the Facebook CEO, CSO, uh, spoke at an AppSec conference here last year, 
where he said, he was asked in the Q&A session, what's the biggest challenge for Yahoo? And he said user security and then broke further down in talking about how they deal with password leaks and password compromises um, and saying, you know, in theory, there's nothing we can do about that, right? The user's choosing to share their password. They're making a choice. We, you know, we, we, we don't really have any role in that choice. But he said in practice, it means they need to kind of readdress how they're dealing with passwords, how they're dealing with their users, and how to limit the, the risk of those compromises because the user is not capable or not willing to do that for themselves. So I, I thought that was a, a very pertinent quote um, related to this discussion. So there are, there are different things you can do. We're going to focus on password leak processing, but I did want to kind of talk through these, and I'm not going to spend as much time. I was going to go into blacklisting a little bit more and contextual risk-based authentication a little bit more. Um, but one of the bad, I would say, bad things you can do is to enforce regular password expiration. Um, and that's been talked to a couple other sessions uh, in this conference where if people are changing their passwords every 60 to 90 days, they at least can't have an exact, they probably won't have an exact match to their other accounts because they'll be incrementing the number on the password that they've been forced to change. You know, maybe a slight difference, and as we talked about earlier um, in some of the leak processing, people are able to guess those transformations fairly easy. So not a great way. Um, incident driven would be like Citrix go to my PC and uh, Pandora, was it Pandora? Let's see if I had one. Oh, Carbonite, Carbonite was the other one. Whoops, there we go. So Pandora and Carbonite, or uh, go to my PC and, and Carbonite detected password guessing attacks on their sites and just reset everybody's password, forced everybody to change their passwords. That's a fairly you know, scorched earth type of policy. Um, it can work, but how often are you going to be able to carry that out and not upset your users? I mean, there was a lot of people that said, I had good passwords on your site, you know, especially with Carbonite where you're doing backups with it. And, now you got to change service passwords and stuff to make sure that it actually continues to back up. Um, that can cause a lot of disruption that your users may not want to deal with. Um, you can design unusual password policy requirements. You know, if you start making sure that people have to start it with no space, you know, no symbols in their password, or they have to have a, uh, you know, two symbols in the middle of their password. Or uh, Mark Burnett has a great site, um, PW, or Twitter feed of uh, PW Two Strong, which. He retweets all the different terrible policies and different sites have. There's, there's ton, and I don't think that typically they're designed to do that, but that is one way that someone could approach this, this problem, saying, well, come up with some crazy requirement. That way our, they won't you know, possibly have the same password on our site as others. You can assign random passwords to users, um, or they don't have to be random. I mean, they could be semi-random or whatever, but you could assign passwords to users. Uh, Linux Mint was hacked earlier this year their, their forums were, their forums and their partner sites or uh, community sites were, their, their database for those were hacked. And as a result of that, one of the choices they made was to just randomly assign all their users' passwords um, for, the, for the new passwords. That lasted about a week. <laughs> um, after that, they realized that people weren't really happy with that choice. They wanted to be able to choose their own passwords. For some of us, it's not as big of a deal. We just plug it into our password manager and go on our way. And, but for others, Either they're trying to have to memorize that or writing it down, or they're just not pleased with having to deal with that uh, possibility. Very high secure sites, you might get away with that. Maybe there's, um, you can justify that and your users aren't going to re um, react too strongly. Um, eliminate passwords altogether. Um, and this is what kind of Yahoo, with their Yahoo account key and, and some other sites like Medium have adopted, where they just basically say, if you want to log into the site, plug in your username, we'll send you an email. You click the link in the email that has basically a session key that logs you into the site. You don't need a password anymore. Everything will be done through your, I mean, your, your email you need a password for, but that's not our responsibility, you know, their responsibility anymore. Um, that's, you know, for some sites, I think, again, lower security, that may be an option you're willing to go with um, just because the passwords then aren't, you have to worry, you know, they have to worry about their email password, but from your perspective, there's nothing else you really have to worry too much about. Uh, Two-factor, multi-factor authentication, two-step verification. I mean, we've been encouraging that for years. So regardless of password use, uh, because of all the other password and account takeover threats, it's a good idea. Um, probably goes without saying. Uh, but it is nice if your password isn't the only line of defense. So if someone guesses your password, they still can't get into your account. Uh, that's ideal. Um, blacklist from leaked passwords. And this is, uh, I'll talk briefly about this, but um, and Jim mentioned yesterday in his talk about the new NIST standard that there's 
some pushes towards, instead of just uh, reacting to people's bad choices after the fact, when you see it in a leak, you tell them, yes, that was a bad password. I mean, not all leak passwords are bad, but um, presumably some of the passwords are, and then you would be telling them not to use them. You could just create that list from scratch or create it from leaked passwords. Um, there's services out there, uh, Password RBL is one I talked to. Um, he's got millions of passwords, essentially, that he's compiled from leaks, um, from attack tools that have password username you know, combo lists. Uh, from different places like that that you can subscribe to. You can generate your own blacklist, um, but you can essentially try to prevent those from the start for all users rather than just saying this one user can't use this one leaked password that we've, we found that they were using somewhere else. Uh, contextual risk-based authentication, there's lots of different names for it, but it's essentially looking at other factors more that you're monitoring more passively um, that are associated with the user's login experience. So you're looking at IP, and geolocating that IP to their normal location. So if I log in from the United States and suddenly I'm coming from Europe, they may flag that for a, you know, they can essentially flag that as a higher risk type of uh, authentication transaction. Uh, LinkedIn did, is doing this and did a great talk at Enigma uh, conference this year. Um, David Freeman there, I think it was called Server Side Second Factors. And he talked about the different, essentially the formula that they use to, to determine risk, you know, browser agent, time of day, you know, all the different IP factors. And they also talked about their success at combating things like account takeover fraud, the fact that just by looking at country, they could eliminate 90 some percent of uh, automated, you know, those, bot, those like the Akamai data, the, the automated large scale attacks because they were coming from other countries. Um, and, and some of the other things like that. So that's certainly something that I think Regardless of whether you're doing this just for, to combat password reuse, this is a good thing that you should be looking at if you're not already having it implemented. All right, so finally, the, in the, the approach we're going to talk in more detail about is looking for password leaks on the internet from other sites, uh, possibly from people claiming it to be your site, and then compare that to your own users. So here's my obligatory kit and picture. But so your goals are doing this is to reduce account takeover, you probably want to eliminate, but to reduce account takeover based on risks that you know to be there. If this password leak is out there and other people have access to it, those accounts by, by logic have a higher chance of being attacked. So you're trying to get ahead of those attacks um, for you know, presumably the riskier accounts, at least from this perspective. Uh, I haven't seen or heard feedback from the companies that are doing this. I would assume that there is some money savings from having to uh, for dealing more proactively with eliminating account takeover threats before the account takeover has happened, when you're not engaging customer service and um, you know, admins or whoever else has to deal with compromised accounts and possibly the loss of business that goes along with customers being frustrated that you didn't protect them even though maybe it was their bad choice that led to the, the account takeover. Um, and then also, as we talked about, demonstrate some security commitment to your users, to your investors, uh, your auditors, your you know, management team, whatever, whoever's kind of in that field of needing some reassurance. So if you've never seen leaks before, if you're not quite sure, I'll give it a brief uh, explanation. Typically, it's going to be just you know, data that's posted on the internet. Um, my experience, and I'll talk a little bit about, about this, the data that I collected a couple years ago, was most of the, at least the small time, compromises come from things like SQL injection, uh, where sites predominantly running PHP would either not program properly to resist SQL injection, so the attacker can then dump their entire user database, get the passwords, you know, usernames and things like that. Sometimes in bigger cases, it comes from just outright server compromises where they, they compromise an application server and then have connections back into the database server that they can pull the data out of. Um, but there's also cases where Trojans and malware are collecting it. Uh, I think Trustwave did an analysis about the Pony botnet, and they had several hundred thousand passwords that had been collected by the, the Pony botnet um, over, I think, a six-month period or something like that. Um, phishing, of course, is, tends to be somewhat lower scale, man the mill attacks. And then there's compilations where people may just collect data over time and then will it down and say, OK, I've grabbed Gmail addresses from seven different sources, and now I'm going to put them all in one file and call it G, you know, a Gmail dump, password dump. Pass, um, even though it didn't technically come from a hack of Gmail. Um, some will be duplicates. P 
People kind of use this as a bragging right in some cases. They put their name on the top and say, hey, we hacked the FBI or we hacked you know, Gmail. Um, and some leaks, of course, as, as you probably have heard, don't just contain password data. You know, the Ashley Madison uh, compromise contained all sorts of personal data. The healthcare breach that happened that was, or I guess, was a leak that was kind of given publicity this week has all sorts of healthcare information. So they're not just limited to you know, username, password, email. Um, there may be lots of other data within them. So you kind of, if you're deciding to do this, you kind of have to make some decisions. And you can be somewhat flexible on this. It's not a binary, yes, we're doing everything, or no, we're not doing anything type decision. Um, probably the most important one is for you to decide if, if you're going to be looking for data that comes from your own site, looking for signs of compromise, or looking for signs that someone is sharing data that supposedly comes from your users or your employees. Um, after that, probably the, you're going to be looking at easy leaks to process. So the larger leaks that have plain text passwords that you don't have to worry about cracking anything, you don't have to worry about um, going through much effort to parse the data or, or try to go out there and, and find the data um, is another, I guess, easy hurdle to overcome. Like I said, the larger leaks. And all the leaks you can find. And this is kind of uh, in talking with um, Michael Coates, who's the Twitter uh, privacy and security officer, he talked about that's kind of their approach. Is they're trying to find everything that's out there um, that they can deal with and, and try to process to protect their users. But as you might guess, that also requires greater commitment to time and resources to try to address that. So if you haven't seen password leaks before, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. These are some from like pastebin type sites where they're just you know text file type formats, um, you know usernames, passwords, emails. Some are going to have them in different order. Some will be tab delimited. Some will be space delimited. Some will be you know, comma delimited. Uh, some will have hash passwords. Some will have plain text passwords. Some will have passwords in a different table than they had usernames. So you'll have to try to correlate them. And just my point being that you, there's, there's not a one size fits all type approach to sucking in that data and having to process it. And in this case also, you can see these, these are passwords over here in parentheses that they've already cracked before they publish the dump out there. This one's more like a SQL type statement um, with all the different fields within there. So I looked at this back, it's been you know, three, four years now, um, to try to get a, a, an idea of the scope of password leaks. And I wrote a blog post about it, which you can see here in the, the reference. But uh, essentially over a two month period, I looked at how many dumps I could find that were specifically had I think my criteria was more than 10 usernames and passwords in them, because some might just have like two or three, and uh, some might be some like one single person had a Trojan on the system and they dumped all his information, kind of like a doxing type of attack. But these were the different results. So December, 154 different password dumps, 125 that had specifically or organizations or a site specifically named as the source of that dump. Whether that was accurate or not, I didn't verify it. Um, plain text passwords, there were 66 dumps and 40 dumps, you know, resulting in 221,000 and 61,000 respectively uh, passwords, and then similar with hash passwords. So you can kind of see there's some variation. There's also in variation in size. Uh, the, the dumps with less than 1,000 passwords, there was a, a pretty good number of those. And a lot of these are just smaller, less secure sites where they throw up a, you know, a university in India throws up a, a CMS for their students to log in and get courseware or uh, a small you know, retailer or something like that throws up a site. Um, and I didn't count up the emails. There were emails included in the December dumps, but the January dumps I actually did say which, which percent of the dumps had emails in them to give you an idea. The rest either had just usernames or some of them may have just been passwords by themselves to give you an idea of are you going to be able to have access to those emails to know if they're your users or not. Um, so, you know, roughly that's, you know, this was, and this was a, a decent amount of work for me to parse through this because there was dozens and dozens more dumps that I saw that didn't have password information and they were just config files or other data that was not passwords that I didn't want to have to deal with. Um, and this was even, auto, like I said, automating just the, I had to manually review them, but I could at least automate the um, scanning for them. Uh, when you were looking at for, for, for emails in there, I mean, emails are being used as usernames. Did you at any point see any leaks, or did you ever think about also looking for usernames that are something else than just an email address? Like, you know, Twitter, as an example, you can log in using your phone number <coughs> if you have given them that. 
uh, you can log in on Twitter using your handle, or you can log in using your yeah. uh, email address. No, I didn't. I didn't do any counting of, of usernames specifically. Um, you can see, like in some of these dumps, like uh, this first one here on the left side, it's got a screen. I guess a S name, screen name, maybe. Mm. That's their username, and it also has their email. I couldn't tell you what that site allowed or used as a login. Um, we know that a lot of sites on the internet, of course, use emails, but yeah, there may be cases where they could do either or. I um, mean, we'll talk more about whether you want to parse usernames yourselves or uh, against your own users or not, but um, that can be problematic. So that's, you know, that's kind of like the kitchen sink. You're, you're looking for as much as you can. You're sucking that in. Um, and I'll talk about some tools here in a minute that may make that easier for you. But you could also just look at the larger scale. And this is kind of a sampling of what's come out. And what I, what I would say has been generally available in the last few months of this year. Um, some of these didn't come from this year, like LinkedIn we know came from, I think, 2013, 2012, okay. And then MySpace is around that same time, and the Twitter one wasn't really Twitter, it was some other site, and they had 400 million entries, but only 32, the million of, 32 million of them were unique entries, and so there's, you know, but you may still um, find that, that that data is still pertinent, and we'll talk about LinkedIn um, here in a little bit, but... Uh, that data may still be relevant even if it's older, but as far as general availability, um, these are kind of what you're looking at as far as large numbers, clearly much larger than the, you know, a few 10,000 password dumps that we see with just crawling Pastebin. And most of these you can't find on sites like Pastebin. You have to look for either people tweeting about them or there's torrents or, you know, maybe some file sh other file sharing sources in the underground. The nice thing is, I guess, once more people get them, they tend to share them more. Like LinkedIn at first was kind of more harder to get a copy of, and now it's, it's fairly easy if you know where to look for it. Let's see, all right. So some tools, Netflix is one of the organizations that does process for password leaks. Um, and they came up with a tool, a Ruby on Rails application a few years ago, which they open sourced called Scumbler. And that's not really a password leak processing tool so much as an intelligence gathering tool that looks for password leaks. So it's a tool that they have for uh, data sources like the pay spins, but also Facebook, uh, Twitter. They look for, they can scan for Twitter. Um, I'm trying to think, probably Google searches and, and some other stuff like that. But they essentially make it so if you, they, they want to put in Netflix password as a term in there, it gives them a workflow and kind of a checklist for them to go through of all the different sources that that tool's found since, since the last time it's been run. You know, you could schedule it to run daily or whatever, and retrieve that information, decide whether it's a threat you need to deal with, whether it's leaked, actual leaked passwords or not, and then um, and process it. Yes? So also be really careful with Scumbler. By default, it will attempt to use email. And its original email source for that should be registered, or designation was not registered. So it was actually sending some of the reports to an unregistered email address. Okay. So he... He mentioned um, Scumbler's output as far as alerting you that you need to process data from it was originally email, and there were some quirks if you're using an older version of it, so make sure you're using a current version. But that, that's kind of their solution, and it works in with some other their tools as far as, like I said, the workflow behind how they process those leaks and decide, because they're looking for other stuff too. If someone says, hey, I hacked, hacked Netflix, but they're not dumping passwords, they're also interested in that type of data. So it's more of a general intelligence gathering, but it can be used specifically for password leaks. Uh, Dumpmon is, is a Twitter account, but it's also an open source project where they are crawling Pastebin for you. And I believe that was one of the primary sources I used when I was doing my research back in 2012 and 13. Um, but you could customize that since you've got the source code to, instead of posting on Twitter, do the same type of thing. Write it into one of your ticketing systems or send yourself alerts when you find specific strings that seem to match password dumps that you want to deal with. Um, there are some sites that there's not really Hashes.org is pretty much the best site that I'm aware of as far as current um, hash dumps. Um, they seem to have a good, and they kind of disguise the name like LinkedIn has a one instead of an I because I guess they're trying to make it harder to search for. But um, they not only have the raw hashes, but they also have cracked hashes. So that can save you a lot of time if you want to just um, take advantage of their work that they've already done. Um, Inside Pro is, a, like I think, a Russian password cracking site that they have forums where uh, people share hashes and stuff like that. There's all sorts of other um, occasional sources that may have either older data or they may leak something every once in a while, but it's, it's kind of hard to find one good source on the internet that has everything you need in one place. 
Yeah. Uh, Inside Pro is a little bit more nefarious than that. It's basically frequented by a large number of people with excess uh, GPU capacity. You can basically post large dumps of uh, uncracked hashes yeah. uh, and, and get them cracked. Uh, I've been watching specific actors responsible for some of the large cloud service provider breaches. And when they pick a, a new target, uh, they'll, they'll pick like the hashes from maybe 50 or 60 employees at a particular cloud provider and, and pump them into Inside Pro with like a, anywhere from a $5 to $100 bounty per hash. Mm -hmm. And they'll usually get around 20 to, 20 to 25% of the accounts um, reversed within about three to four hours. Yeah. So that's, that's how yep. effective it is. Yep. So he mentioned basically that Inside Pro does kind of like a crack for pay um, in their forms where you can say, hey, I want these cracked and you can offer a bounty for it. And um, so it's not always just like good natured password sharing. Sometimes it's, it's more of the criminal element involved in that too. Uh, of course, a lot of the dumps we've seen this year have been offered for sale initially, like the LinkedIn and MySpace data on you know underground sites where they sell everything from drugs to you know whatever else that you wouldn't be able to sell on a normal site. Um, those can be a little bit harder to track down just because you need to get access to them. Sometimes they're a little bit more careful about that. Sometimes they're not. Depends on which sites you're talking about. I'm not aware of any just like a underground, like a Carding Pro type site that's specifically focused on credentials. You know, they're, they're, their only interest is credentials. So it tends to be mixed in with the other either data sales or things like that that people may have, um, credit card sales, other, other types of data dumps that are out there. Um, law enforcement may also, I've, I've heard cases, I think, with Time Warner Cable where the FBI like said, hey, we found this data we think may be associated with you and you might want to take a look at it. Um, I wouldn't count on them doing that for you. If, you. if they do, great, but it's probably more of a, you know, try to know who your local cybersecurity person is in the Secret Service and FBI or your national, national law enforcement agency of choice. But um, that's like, it's nice if you get it, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't count on it. Um, there are a couple companies that are specifically focused on providing you with either password leaks or allowing you to check your users against the password leak data that they have uh, collected. Um, Hold Security um, is run by Alex Holden, which will, you've probably heard him in the news in the last few years, but um, they've got several, you know, they have a pretty, I guess, mature uh, program for going out there, getting large data leaks from their underground connections. They do, some, they do crack some of the passwords themselves. They put in, you know, it said like about a week's worth of effort. They do find a lot of plain text passwords. Um, and their idea is that they sell you essentially a, an API service to query users and find out if your users, whether they're employees or customers, have passwords in their, their database. And if you need to crack them, you can crack them, you know, do further cracking on your own. Leak source is a little bit newer. Um, they've also kind of focused more on the end user um, as far as you can go out there, plug in your email, and they'll show you which sites you've been, you know, your credentials have been leaked through, um, but they are off also offering a business option. Uh, again, they do some password cracking themselves. They've got the API, and you would have to subscribe to that. Uh, threat intelligence service providers I'm not as familiar with, and I would imagine that if you they found a leak that had your name on it, they'd probably tell you about, but they may not be willing to share, like, you know, a Netflix dump with you if they found something like that. I don't have any, like I said, if you've got feedback on that, certainly feel free to, to, to pitch in. But um, I know that they'll at least alert of, you know, hey, LinkedIn had this big credential dump and there may be something you're going to be aware of, but they may not provide you with that data directly. The leak source, though, doesn't just allow you to look at your end user's data. It allows you to search anybody's data. Right. Yeah, he mentioned that leak source doesn't restrict you to just searching for your own user's data. You can essentially search for any matching emails within the dump. Um, and I would imagine hold security is probably the same way, but uh, I don't know that for sure. So you've got these leaks, whether you're pulling them from large sources or single sources, you've got to decide, uh, make some choices on how to process that. But the first one, like I mentioned, there's duplicates. So you probably would be good to have like an indexing type of a history where you're saying, okay, we've already done leaked, you know, LinkedIn from 2012. We've already done blah, blah, blah. So you don't waste time going back over the same data, um, especially if, if you've got uh, you're parsing a lot of the small dumps where you're probably getting duplicates every month if you're, if you're doing that. Um, the cleanup and conversion of data, some of this can be automated. Just things, like I said, I showed you the, kind of the different formats. There's headers and footers and different columns, and you can sometimes use regular expressions to pull out hashes and email addresses, but getting the other data may be problematic. 
Um, so there's, a, and then of course, if you're presumably you want to filter that and focus on your users, you just care about the email addresses that match your user, data, your user accounts. There's another decision about which users you're worried about. Um, Pandora was the one that got the leaked in data and any user with an email in that, in that dump had their password reset or had, you know, got flagged for password reset. They didn't try to crack the passwords. They didn't try to make sure that they were the same. Um, that, as you might guess, angered some people uh, that didn't use the same passwords, probably frustrated some others that weren't sure why that was going on. Um, and again, it's kind of like that nuclear option of we're not really willing to put in much effort into this, but we want you to be secure. Uh, so they're kind of pushing that back in the, in the, in the user's responsibility realm. Um, any user with a username appearing in the list, and kind of back to your question about if you should look at usernames, that can be problematic just because usernames aren't necessarily unique, you know, globally unique. Uh, email addresses are a little bit better about that, although they can be reassigned over time. Um, but, you know, J. Smith is a username. There's probably a lot of sites out there with a J. Smith that isn't your J. Smith. Um, uh, Alex Stamos also mentioned in that same presentation from uh, the app, apps at California that they do strip off the, the um, recipient of email addresses and check that against matching usernames within Yahoo, at least they did at the time, um, for matches. So for them, I mean, but they were specifically also looking for password matches. So if the coincidence that J. Smith 1 and J. Smith 2 had the same password, J. Smith was still getting a password reset even if he wasn't necessarily the same guy. And of course, the, the more precise option is to say if the username and email specifically match, that's who we're going to worry about putting through the reset process. So deal, depending on what type of data you're dealing with, um, like I mentioned, sometimes you're getting hashes, sometimes you're getting plain text. Plain text, you're normally going to take that, put it through your normal hashing process. Uh, you may have to pull down the user's salt if you're salt, hopefully, please, hopefully, salt in your password so you would have to retrieve some of that data. Um, if you have an existing API that this works well with, it may be fine. Otherwise, you may have to decide to design something specifically for password leak processing, either to, you know, because it's, you're dealing with different uh, performance issues or you do things in your normal login process that don't, don't make that um, you know, the right approach to take for this. Um, if they are hashed, you're going to identify the hash, you know, whether it's MD5 or SHA-1 or something else, and then have to decide how much effort you're going to put into cracking that. Um, my recommendation would be to say we want to prevent people from getting their passwords cracked if they are having, you know, similar to what an attack, the amount of effort an average attacker is going to be. So maybe that's a week, maybe that's two, three days. Um, you're going to have to try to make that decision yourself. Um, as far as the different approaches, I mean, we don't really need to get too much, too much into that. You're going to try different approaches to crack the passwords. Um, you can certainly customize that. Your policy is eight characters and higher. You don't have to try to crack passwords lower than seven characters. That can be problematic as far as the different hashes. Um, this is a presentation, a data from a presentation that Rick Redmond did uh, from CoreLogic a few years ago where he, over a six-month period, they gathered data on what types of hashes they saw on the dumps that they were capturing. MD5 was like 46% 40, of all the dumps they saw. SHA-1 was, I don't know, 4% or it's, it was much lower. But you can kind of see you're dealing with a lot of different options. And this is just the top ones. They had, I don't know, a list of 30 or something that that they gathered, um, and you can look at that source for more data. But the idea just being it's not going to be an easy, everything's MD5 or SHA-1, you may have to deal with more options than that. Um, one alternative to hashing, um, or to, to going through the cracking process, is something that we learned about with the Facebook presentation that Alec Muffet did a couple years ago in, in Passwords Crack, Passwords Con Oslo, or I'm not? Uh, Trondheim. Trondheim, okay. He talked about how Facebook deals with passwords, and one of the things he mentioned was that before, you know, they, they use, I think, Scrypt, HMAC, and some others, so they're, they're doing better security, but he mentioned that they do have an option for feeding passwords through MD5, the normal user passwords, through the login process through MD5 first, and then into the more complicated, uh, secu more secure systems. So if you find an MD5 dump and you're users' passwords ahead of time have already been hashed with MD5 initially, and then your more secure alternatives, you can just skip that MD5 hashing process and put them through your more secure process. You know, again, maybe having to pull down uh, seed values, and, or seed values, salt values. But you could make that comparison even without having to crack the original password. Just, like I said, assuming MD5 to MD5, SHA-1 to SHA-1, you've, you've got comparable uh, types of approaches. 
Um, if you're going to do that for more than one, like if you're going to do MD5 and SHA-1 and who knows what else, you may have to have additional records stored within your account database. You may not want to go through that much trouble. It kind of depends on how serious you want to take it and save yourself some trouble. One approach I thought of, which I'm not sure if it's good or bad because it's got some, it's got some drawbacks, is instead of trying to crack those passwords, you decide to um, just compare users when they log in, take their plain text password they provide to you, hash it if you've already determined how those passwords have hashed, if they have a matching record in, in different dumps, make the comparison then without having to do any cracking on your own. So that's going to compare both the secure and less secure passwords. The problem is you kind of have to keep that database around for an indefinite amount of period of time. Maybe users don't log in except for every couple months. Um, it's definitely more overhead. You may not want to have to deal with that, but it would get you out of some cracking work. Uh, so what to do and tell your users? Um, you could just notify users. You don't have to necessarily force them to reset their password. Um, that's kind of what LinkedIn did. LinkedIn, the initial dump had like some six million passwords in it. So I understand that they made those users reset passwords if they had a matching password. Um, but the most recent dump that had all you know 117 million um, accounts in them um, had not been reset for the most part. In fact, LinkedIn reported of those like 117 million users, more than 100 million had not reset their password at all. And that was after all the media attention. You know, LinkedIn was in the news a lot about being breached and passwords being compromised, but they didn't tell users to change it. And some users probably said, if I don't, you know, LinkedIn's not telling me to do it, I don't need to worry about it. So that's kind of the give it back in the user's hands, but they may not make the decision you want them to make. So if that's concerning to you, don't, don't let them make the decision. You can lock the account. Um, there's, you can either do a custom unlock workflow where you say you have to go to this page to reset, you know, recover from this, which some sites have done. Most of the larger ones seem to try to push people through the normal forgotten password workflow, because so, you've already got that in place. It's better to reuse that same code and functionality. The problem can be like in the Tumblr case where they had to reset some user passwords, is that this is literally the only message they gave their users. It's time to reset your password once, once they tried to log in. They didn't know why. They didn't have any context of what the, why this was happening for them. So if you're going to put them in through your normal password workflow, you may want to have some sort of a flag you can set where it says, you know, click here for more information, and it points them to a URL where you can explain why that's happening. Um, you can do what Microsoft and, and Facebook and some others do, which is to not lock the account necessarily. They can still log into the account, but once they log in, they're required to go through uh, a password reset workflow. Um, but they're also subjected to that secondary authentication during that process. So they're looking at, are you coming from a country I know, or are you coming from a browser I know, and things like that. And of course, invalidate session tokens is also important if you've got uh, mobile apps or persistent cookies or something like that where um, even if they're not, they may not be logging in, so you can't necessarily force them to your, your login workflow. I've got to kind of rush through this, but there's some important things to tell your users why it's happening. There's going to be confusion on their part. Um, I don't recommend that the, there's a question about the name of the third party. I would say typically you don't want to tell them where the leak came from, um, and that may cause some confusion, but as we'll talk about from a privacy standpoint, that could be problematic as well. Uh, make sure you, comp you emphasize your site wasn't compromised. This is from a third party. Um, whether or not unauthorized access was detected on their specific account, that's also helpful for them to, to understand that you're protecting them. Education, media, some stuff like that. Nuisance leaks, um, I'm going to skip through this. Basically, just you may have to process stuff that didn't come from you. Like uh, there was a release um, a few months ago where large email providers, and here's the actual headline that came with it, you know, breach it, it, these big major email providers. Well, it wasn't a breach. That's just the way that routers, routers decided to spin it. But um, they had to process this data, and they found that a very, you know, so, as far as a percent of the accounts that were in there, a very minimal amount were actually valid data. The mass, vast majority was either old data, fake data. Um, regardless, they had, to, they had to go through and process it. So you're calling 2% of minimal? Well, 2% of what was in there, if they, I mean, what they were claiming. Clearly, 2% of meaning 476,000 accounts, that's pretty significant. But as far as the percent of... Yeah. My, my point is, like I said, not that you wouldn't care to reset this data, just that the data itself was, for the most part, bad data. It wasn't something you know, that you would normally have to worry about, except for those small percents that you do. 
Was it really bad data or was it just uh, mischaracterized data, like you were saying before, where somebody accumulates all these breaches and then sucks out just the Gmail addresses and says, hey, Gmail's been breached? Yeah, and in a lot of kinds of times we don't know. Like uh, I'll mention, and this is some headlines from it, but it's a Pandora confusion. Well, I guess I don't have it in here. Uh, someone basically said that Amazon Kindle was hacked. Um, they had a record, 80,000 records, and that turned out to be entirely fake data. So sometimes it's completely made up. Sometimes it is just old data from collections that are years old that's no longer valid. Um, but any, regardless. Um, so quickly going over this, there is some risks involved with processing this. Like I said, users confused about, how do you know, there, how'd you know my password was in this leak? Are you keeping my password in plain text? Are you encrypting it? When Facebook announced their policy, there was a lot of comments on there and as well as other news articles about it from users who were confused about that. Um, some people, if you lock the accounts, they're not gonna be able to get back into their accounts. They've changed email addresses, they don't have access to their email, their phone number's changed. Whatever recovery options you have for them aren't gonna work. So just be aware you're gonna have to deal with that in some cases. Um, privacy concerns, uh, if you tell me, you know, we found your password in Ashley Madison or we found your password in Fur Affinity, I'm gonna say like, I'm not sure I want you to know that I was using that site. Um, I haven't heard of people specifically being concerned about this, but I'm not, I would not be surprised if I heard um, concerns from users being voiced. And notification fatigue, uh, you know, if this is happening every month, I could certainly see that being a problem. Um, legal risks, the short answer is talk to your legal team because um, you're dealing with stolen data. Um, from a US law perspective, federal law perspective, uh, if you're not actively using that to compromise sites, you might be okay. Um, from a trade secret intellectual property standpoint, it kind of depends on what data you have. Um, and of course, avoid actually testing those credentials. So successes, um, you know, WordPress went out there, looked at Gmail data that was compromised, found 100,000 users that used the same credentials, and they were able to reset those people's passwords before they got compromised. You know, Yahoo, um, Alex Stamos again mentioned that they, in, in, in some of the bigger password dumps they deal with, 10 to 20% of the entries, match their users and they're able to get those passwords reset before it causes much trouble. And Twitter also felt like it was successful. So I like to feature my niece in every year's uh, slides and this is, she's plugging the password leak of course. This isn't gonna solve all your problems um, when it comes to account takeover, but it's, it may help you and uh, demonstrate your commitment. So I'll open up for question and answer. I'll just kind of slowly tab through the references so we can get it recorded in the video, but I also have a link to my slides at the end so you don't have to worry about, worry about writing these down. But any questions? Uh, this is really just more of a comment maybe to help. Um, I recently did a uh, analysis of the LinkedIn data uh, against a large uh, e-commerce site and uh, just against the subset of uh, commercial customers, there were a, about a 16% overlap uh, between the LinkedIn data and their active customers. And of those approximately 300,000 users, uh, only 10% of them had changed the password since the LinkedIn breach. So yeah. that kind of gives you some sense of what the potential exposure is from these breaches and giving you the incentive to go, you know, to go down this road. Yeah. Yeah, the customer angle, um, I guess I, I agree on the 10%. We tried resetting passwords and uh, password reset email to about 4,000 people and about 200 people changed their passwords. So it's, 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 it's a tricky issue. Uh, yeah, yeah you, can, it's, you can easily uh, off-put customers um, from your website. Uh, easily by doing that. Also, an interesting observation. Um, so all the um, all the all the leaks that recently have been for sale for one dollar and all that stuff. Uh, it, it seems like the information uh, that's being sold now is probably the same one that uh, maybe Alex Holden has uh, or has had for a number of years. Only now gotten into uh, somebody else's hands. Yeah. So yeah. A lot of them seem like it's people that are they've maybe not weren't in, even directly in, involved with the hacking it when it originally happened, but they were one of the you know, inner circle of people that happen to have that private data and they've decided now, well, I might as well sell it and try to get some money out of it or share it or whatever the case may be. Um, so you, you mentioned, briefly touched on um, the possibility of storing user passwords in a weaker hash algorithm in order to compare against leaks or leak data. Um, do you have any advice for making your system robust such that 
Um, if you decide to follow that strategy, you don't make your own system more risky or more risk prone to a dump. Sure, and let, and let me be clear on that. You're, the, the, my advice is not that you store an MD5 record, password hash record for your users. It's that you hash with MD5 and then you use your S crypt or B crypt or PBKDF2 on, that ha on the resulting hash of that. So the idea being that you've, you're starting from a known, known place, the MD5 hash. So if you get more MD5 hashes in from a leak, you can then put them through that same, you know, starting on that step, put them through your stronger password hashing process, and then compare the results without having to crack those original MD5 passwords. But yeah, don't, don't store like an extra record with MD5 or SHA-1 or anything weaker than that. Okay, so I'm gonna stop it there, and uh, I will give you, I'll actually give you the opportunity to have lunch. Uh, when we get back again, the next two talks are really taking us into the psychology and linguistics area of passwords, and I'm really looking forward to those talks as well. So be back here at two o'clock, okay? Thank you.